unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language. But the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Come on somebody, raise your voice. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Rosalande Rikosha.
Somebody has a car here. The number plate is UAH046G. The bonnet is opening, the lights are going on, they are going off. The side mirrors are opening and closing, it is moving and then coming back. So the security <laughs> needs your help. <laughs> People in the overflow say amen. Hallelujah. Tell God you are amazing. Tell him, God. Kale, you are amazing. <laughs> ah, thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Second Timothy. Chapter 3. If you're there, you say, Amen. Second Timothy, chapter 3. If you're there, you say, Amen. Second Timothy chapter three. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter three. And we are going to begin from the tenth verse. From the tenth verse. Somebody say Amen. amen. Thank God for the choir. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Last, uh, 
I think it should have been last Friday. God, I think, was it Friday? Yes, it's last Friday. I was preaching somewhere. And God stirred up something for me to share. And I shared for about an hour and a half, close to two hours. But I did not finish that sermon. A few hundreds of you were there. And um, somebody asked me and told me, Apostle, sometimes you promise to finish sermons and it takes you 20 years. Why don't you finish this one on Thursday? So I promised them, okay, I'll finish it this Thursday. So if you didn't listen to it, I recommend. I know not all of you are going to buy the CDs or follow through. Not because I don't have faith in you, but because I understand. (laughs) But I'm sure everyone needs to hear what was shared last Friday. If you're a serious Christian. Hallelujah. Or if you're serious about Christianity. Hallelujah. I opened up some that I could not finish then. But then when somebody insisted, I said, I'm going to finish it. Because they told me, with this, with desire. And I also felt it in my heart that if I don't finish it, I might lose the interest to share it soon. Praise the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 3 verses 10. The Bible says, let's read, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. That's number one. Number two, manner of life. Number three, purpose. Number four, faith. Number five, long suffering. Number six, charity or love. Number seven, patience. Number eight, persecution. Number nine, afflictions. Which came, which came unto me, the Bible says, at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra. Which persecution he said I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And the next verse says, Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, shall suffer persecution. And the next verse says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue, the Bible says, thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Knowing of whom. Knowing of whom. Praise the Lord. You should never forget. Or you should never take for granted who you learn from. I'm not saying people in this world don't teach. I'm only saying never forget who you learn from. Hallelujah. You can listen to everyone teaching if they are preaching what is agree, agreeable to you or what is agreeable to truth. You know, there are some times where something might not be agreeable to you, but it's agreeable to truth. And that's okay. But everybody in this world must have a primary instructor. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You must know who you learn from. Today in the Christian faith, everyone wants to learn from everyone. Men become too desperate and then they float the rules of learning. Never become too desperate and then you float the rules of learning. You can be hungry and thirsty, but it's risky to have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. amen. Never take for granted. That's why the Bible in the scripture says, treat them with double honor. <laughs> you understand? You must honor who teaches you. You must know from whom you learn. Praise the Lord. Why? Because your destiny is in the hands of who teaches you. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Your destiny is in the hand of who? Teaches you. That's why it's important to honor all who labor among us. The Bible says, all the people who labor among us, we ought to honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So, it's not a place of seeking to put you under a certain control. No. If you don't learn from here, learn from somewhere, but learn from somewhere. I don't know if I'm making sense. In this world, every man must learn from somewhere. Because why? 
Paul says, I come to you that I might impart unto you some spiritual thing. The word there is charismatos, the miraculous faculty, which in the end you might be established. In the end you might be established. The word there is that you might be aligned to, the, to a particular course of your destiny. Your destiny can change by listening to one man. Your life can change by one summer. Hallelujah. So it's important for you to know which seed is your kind. What, which seed you feel should be reproduced in your spirit? Praise the Lord. Know who you learn from. Tell your neighbor, know who you learn from. Praise the Lord. Why? Because when God sets people in our lives, let me tell you something. The reason why we honor them is they put certain things in us. It's like an extension of their grace in us. You understand? That's why Paul tells the, that, I think, is it Philippians or Ephesians? He tells them, well, Philippians, I think. He says, you're partakers of my grace. Partakers of my grace. A man who doesn't teach you cannot claim that right. Okay? But a man who teaches you can claim that right. Praise the Lord. He says, even as it is meant for me to think this of all of you, because I have you in my heart, in as much as both in my bonds and, that, and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, he says, ye are all partakers of my grace. There are things out of your teacher that come out of his spirit and settle inside you. You should honor that they didn't begin in you. You should honor that, that they did not begin in you. You didn't have the guts to pray. You learned to pray. You didn't have the mind to believe. You learned to believe. In this instance, we are not supposed to honor men above God. No. But also, it's godly to honor men who teach you. Say amen. amen. I'm going to give you a story that I've never given openly. One time, I was with my father at home. And then we argued about something. We weren't quarreling, but we were arguing. Then, he became disappointed and was speaking Luganda with him. <laughs> so, in my, when I got too much disturbed in my spirit, that daddy was not understanding what I'm saying, I spoke back to him in English and I said, but daddy, why don't you understand what I'm explaining to you? And we was speaking Luganda. So I turned and said, why don't you understand? Then he asked me, of that English you're speaking, have you ever put on a shilling? <laughs> I thought about it and I realized uh, I don't I didn't put a shilling on my English. Oh, ho, ho. He told me from today, you only speak to me in English when I want you to speak in English. If I don't want you to speak in English, never say anything in English because you didn't buy it. And he was right. I realized a man can buy something and put it in you. It's not yours. Never forget. This English is for Mr. Matovu. Mine, I'll put it in my children. It was a sermon. I repented that day. I don't use English unless when he speaks to me in English. Because it is his. <laughs> and he can say one word and take it away. And I know that. He can say one word and take it away. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Know who you learn from. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, know who you learn from. Praise the Lord. Some of you have pastors. Where you learn. They put in new things and you use those things to destroy them. Know who you learn from. Tell your neighbor, know who you learn from. Somebody say amen. So Paul says, you've understood my doctrine. There are nine things that we counted. One is, my doctrine. Now, you remember from about Fanero 80, when I told you that in the consequent weeks, I'm going to start sharing about the order of things. You understand? 
And these are nine things. And these nine things represent something very spiritual. Praise the Lord. Let's read them again. Uh Uh-huh. One. My doctrine. Uh Uh-huh. My manner of life. Uh Uh-huh. Sorry? My purpose. Uh Uh-huh. Your faith. Uh Uh-huh. Your long suffering. Uh Uh-huh. Charity or love. Uh Uh-huh. Your patience, uh uh-huh. Your persecutions and afflictions. Hallelujah. It begins with a doctrine. Praise the Lord. It begins with a doctrine. Then that doctrine produces a certain manner of life. And that manner of life leads a man to a particular purpose. And that purpose creates in a man a particular faith. And that faith creates in a man a particular long-suffering. And that long-suffering, a particular love. And that love, a particular patience. And in there he can endure persecutions and stand afflictions. You understand? So, the number nine is, so those of you know, is the last of the greatest numbers. Isn't it? One, two, three, nine, then zero, right? Ten. Zero, one, da, 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 da. then 29, then, you understand? So, in its own, the number nine represents the end of things in their completion. A kind of cycle to begin another. It's the end of things in their completion. In its own, intricately, it has a mind of the complete sense and end of things in understanding what makes, in this context, the minister Paul. Those nine things must be in every child of God, who we regard as a complete minister. You understand? If you say you're patient, but you're not long-suffering, you're not complete. There's few things that are wanting. Hallelujah. That's why Paul tells uh, uh, who? In Titus, he says, I left thee in Crete, that I may set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in the city. The ordination of the elders in the city comes after the setting in order the things that are wanting. Are we together? If you're a minister and you have not understood doctrine, if you're a minister and you have not followed after a particular manner of life because of the doctrine which you've been taught, If you're a minister and you don't have purpose, if you're a minister and you don't move in faith, or you're not established in the faith, if you're a minister and you're not long-suffering, you're not loving, you're not patient, that's what makes you incomplete. One of those makes you incomplete. The fullness then is the beginning of the end and fulfillment of completion in the life of a Christian. Somebody say amen. That is why in the normal life of humanity, nine months. Pregnant. Number nine, right? In the ninth month, you're supposed to what? To bring forth. You remember Jesus at the cross? He gave up his ghost at the ninth hour. He had finished the completion of of things. Hallelujah. And many such things. When he speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, if you've counted those entities, how many are they? Nine. Do you understand what I mean? So, in its own, it represents a kind of finality in the completion of things. Finality in the completion of things. It deals with all the details that complete you. Are we together? Are we together? Now, let me show you a mystery. If you realize when Paul is speaking about these things, I want to show you about three things that I want you to note before I go deep. Deeper, sorry. He says that These things came at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. There's a reason why Paul mentions these three, and the Spirit of the Lord was speaking to me about it. So he led me to search out these three, and I realized, one, Antioch, the Bible says, was where they defined them as Christians, first, because there was much teaching. Are we together? These things start to manifest in the life of a man. They came 
to Paul. They came to Paul. The beginning experience was when he was at Antioch. Are we together? He was at Antioch, where there was much teaching. That means that the beginning of these things starting to work in your life, even persecution, is when you start to learn from God. Are we together? And that is why I tell people, that you might miss the point when the Bible says that you shall preach this gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. Because if you read the scriptures, when the children of Israel, I mean, when, when the church had begun in uh, Jerusalem, and the gospel started to move, you realize that the first place it moved to from Jerusalem was Antioch, not Judea. Are you hearing me? So the instruction of preaching the gospel is in Jerusalem, it is in Judea, it is in Samaria, it is in the uttermost parts of the world, but God mentions not the place of Antioch, because in Antioch he didn't expect you more to be ministering than being ministered to. That's the preparation stage of every minister. Are you with me? Are we together? So, every child of God, the moment Jerusalem, see, remember the instruction, tarry in Jerusalem until the Spirit come. The moment the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and the signs and wonders are on us. Some of us, the first thing we know is we go to America. The Lord has sent me. You understand? We go to Europe, and they devolve parts. The Lord has sent me. And some of them don't go genuinely. Some of them go because they are poor. That's the truth. They're poor and they don't know how to make money here. So they say, ah, yeah. Now, eh? I think if I go there and I am paid in dollars, I'll preach more. And that's why many, when they reach there, God carries Antioch and takes it there. <laughs> and then they start to learn hard lessons. Before you know that, by the time they come back, they appear to be students and not teachers. <laughs> Hallelujah. Never move until God has spoken to you. Somebody say Amen. If God tells you stay in Uganda, listen, some of us have invitations that take forever. I cancel meetings every day in America and across because I need to stay back home. Because I'm instructed to be here. Do you understand what I'm saying? And brother, he's blessed me here. <laughs> Somebody say amen. God can bless you anywhere. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of you, the moment I get a visa, my life will never be the same again. No, when you come in contact with God, your life will never be the same again. Listen, never substitute God for a visa. Tell your neighbor, God is not cheap. Some guys say, the moment I was in a flight and I, I, was, I landed in London, I knew up there is a God. I said, no. No. Somebody shared our summons in Switzerland. And then a lady said, I've been dreaming to go to America, but I now have changed my mind. The first ticket I buy, I want to go to Uganda and attend Fanero. <laughs> I said, yeah! I say, that's it. Let me tell you, and on each one of you, on each one of you, on each one of you, men will wish to come to you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Why? Because they will see that there is a God in you. They will see that there is a God in you. Hallelujah. Some of you are just seated in those chairs for only but a few weeks. A few months. A few years. Something will change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So tell your neighbor. Handle me well. Tell your neighbor, handle me well. Come on, prophesy on your life. Say, hand on me well. Something is coming. And it's in my spirit. I feel it in my bones. It's inside my blood. It vibrates in my bones. Hallelujah. It's in my head every day. I dream about it. I think it every time. I speak it. Tell your neighbor, hold, hand on me well. Just hand on me well. Just handle me well. When a woman is pregnant, they know. I said, when a woman is pregnant, they know. Hallelujah. 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 It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. I feel it. Me, I don't know about you. I feel it. I feel it. You know, God has been rebuking me recently. And you know the rebuke. So he's been telling me, Grace Arena is too small for you. I'm repenting every day. By the way, continuing here, I feel like I'm... 
Do you understand? <laughs> Tell your neighbor we are bigger than you think. We are bigger. Pluro Mugambe, we are bigger than you think. Jesus is in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, many brethren, they, they skip the most vital part at Antioch. And that was the trouble Agabus had. The Bible says he prophesies a famine. He leaves Jerusalem, immediately goes to Judea. So by the time he comes to minister to Paul, he doesn't know how to minister to him. He tells him, you're going to be arrested. But he can't see more than that. Yet the Acts 13 prophets told him, no, we know. We've seen all that and we lay hands on you. You understand? So that is what I'm trying to tell us. That whether you want it or not, everybody needs an Antioch experience. And that's what Paul says. All these nine things start to work in him as a minister the moment he's in Antioch. Hallelujah. Where teaching begins. That's why the Bible says that these, these persecutions, these trials, these temptations come to you on account of the word. You understand? Let me tell you, brethren. That's why I don't judge men who are in trouble. Because I don't know what they've learned. Sometimes people are in trouble because they know too much. And then we judge them thinking we know better. Remember Paul? Paul says, and to keep me from getting puffed up because of the abundance of revelation, they sent a messenger to buffet me. See, Paul is not being persecuted because he's a bad man. He's not suffering affliction because he's a spiritual babe. No. He's suffering affliction because he knows too much. And what we do? We get those ones and kill them. Are you hearing me? We don't have a way to deal with people. It's easy for me to preach against Paul because of that affliction. In the flesh, the word there is sax, S-A-R-X. It could be anything besides only sickness because it's a flesh issue. Maybe he had a temptation. Maybe anything. But you see, the point is, the guy had an attack because he knew too much. He just had too much. <laughs> Do you understand? If, if a, like one time I was telling people that, when you look at the, I was sharing in a small group of people, and I told them, look at Elijah, Elisha experiences, okay? Elijah runs away, oh, Jezebel, in my case, God tells him there are 7,000 that have not bowed their, their face to bow. Are you hearing me? And then the Bible says, the moment God tells him that, he walks out, and when he walks out, he finds Elisha, and his eyes are open to the 7,000, and he casts a mantle. But 6,999 6, were not discovered. They died hid in God. You understand? And those ones hid can even persecute who? Or speak against Elijah and say, ah, Elijah is a spiritual babe, he's unstable. How come they can look for him? For us, we are hid. You understand? It's one thing for you to be hid and you don't have purpose. It's another when you persecute a man under attack because he has purpose. Maturity. Tell your neighbor, maturity. maturity. Hallelujah. So, sadly, some of them might never have an experience. And that's why their names are not written. <laughs> but Elijah was written about. Listen, I would rather be <laughs> looked, af- looked for but when I'm on purpose, then just be hid. No, we came, we expected fireworks. He only promised that he shall keep us. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, he shall keep us. That is why I tell Christians, persecution, if you live godly in Christ, doesn't matter how deep you are, persecutions will come. But how you respond to them, praise the Lord. And, and somebody said, ah, no, let me just passively respond. I said, no, I refuse. This persecution is one for my sake. Yes, they could be one for your sake. But there's a certain knowledge you must have. Let me show you something the Lord showed me one time. And from that day, I started dancing when I'm persecuted. Can I show it to you? <laughs> you remember the time Paul is, is talking about them which feel that him out of the way they'll thrive. You know, some preach the gospel in strife and envy. Some preach it in, 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 uh, in the right doctrine. Some add... Uh, bondage to him and some edify him. You remember that scripture? Now, let's go, give me the message. I want to show you something. 
You should never forget this. It says, it's true that some here preach. It's true that some here preach. Christ. Because with me out of the way, they think they'll step into the right, the spotlight. But the others do it with the best heart in the world. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I'm here defending the message, wanting help. And the other group is what? And the others, now that I'm out of the picture, they're merely what? Greedy. Hoping to get something out of it for themselves. Their motives are bad. They see me as their competition. And so the worse it goes for me, the better they think for me. For them, sorry. Some, there are people in this world, when you worsen, they celebrate. And they, they are Christian. Never forget that. Next verse. And he says, so how am I to respond? Huh? He says, I've decided that I really don't care about their motives. Whether mixed, bad, or indifferent. Every time one of them opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just what? Cheer them on. And I'm going to keep that celebration going on. Yes. But the next verse is important. The point is in the next verse. Because I know how it's going to turn out. Through your faithful prayers and the generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything, listen, He wants to do in and through me will be done. Listen, if you want God to fully do something in a man, persecute Him. Ah, let me turn to these ones. These ones don't get me. It, mucho, if, if you want God to work in a man and fully, fully fulfill what he wants to do in him, persecute him. Persecution is there to allow God. Tell your neighbor. Persecution is there to allow God to work in you and through you. Oh, tell him again. Tell him persecution is there for God to work in you. And through you. Oh. Oh. So why do you worry? Why do you worry? Why do you worry? So when persecution comes, I say, God, now what, what do you want to do in me? <laughs> Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, God must be up to something. He must be up to something. When I read that, I started dancing. I don't weep when I'm persecuted. I dance. I dance. My spirit starts to rejoice. Why? Because the spirit of the supply of the spirit of Christ working in me. There God starts to now say, "Uh uh-huh. Now what do I need to add in this? Let me tell you. Once persecution comes, even if you didn't have a gift, God can give it to you. Just to fulfill his promise in you. Never worry when they say things about you, child of God. Ah, 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 ah. Always look to the things ahead of you. Where Christ is. I love the way Paul says, where Christ is. Because Christ is ahead of you. Always. He's never in the back. He's not in your history. He's not in your story. You understand? He's not there to remind them what you did last week. No, no, no. He's, he's up there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Always telling you, let's go. Let's go. There's deeper stuff. There's more. Don't never. So, I love. Hallelujah. It is, there is something I think in First Peter 2, is it 2.19? Can you get me there? Uh-huh. <laughs> the Bible says, it is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. It's, it's, thank, it's, it's thankworthy. As in God tells you, thank you. You understand? And the next verse says, For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, take it patiently. Because that is acceptable with God. Take it patiently. For that is acceptable with God. Hallelujah. Next verse. For even here unto you are what? <laughs> Called. Reading the message. The message says in that very verse, he says, for this is the kind of life <laughs> you've been what? Invited into. The kind of life Christ lived. He suffered everything that came his way so you would know that it would be done and also know how to do it step by step. The next verse. He never did one thing wrong. Not once said anything.
anything amiss. Praise the Lord. They called him every name in the book and he said nothing back. That's why we don't talk back. Never talk back. Hold your peace. The Bible says, by good works, silence the works of ignorant and foolish men. Just do that. Just do that. By good works. You understand? Silence the what? The ignorant and foolish men. Praise the Lord. You see, let me tell you something about the grace message. Some say, ah, the grace message, ah! You know, I, there, there are some people, I'm surprised, some say, they tell people, steal, kill, do everything wrong, ah! And then, we, then they think all of you drive your cars here. And then we tell you, kill, ah! And then you go out with punk and they say, ah! Who is there to kill, ah! And then you strike someone and then you kill them and say, ah, I'm under grace! <laughs> You see, you remember the scripture in Titus, I think, which says it, the grace teaches us to de- uh, deny all and only this. You remember that scripture? For so many people actually don't understand that. Let me see. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that, not to. <laughs> you understand? So the instruction of grace doesn't tell you don't kill. The instruction of grace reveals Christ until you can't kill. <laughs> do, do you understand? There's a certain version. Do you have the W-E-B? Uh, I don't even think he has it. There's a version one time I read about that scripture. And it said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men to the intent that we deny <laughs> Ungodliness. To the intent that the moment grace comes to a man, somehow he starts to deny. So it's, it's a work of grace for you to walk out. Grace doesn't tell you not to. No. It just reveals Christ and then you stop. That's the difference grace and love. Somebody say amen. amen. Now let's go back to the point. There's like a point I wanted to pick. Eh? Have you learned something? Okay, let's go deeper. Now, Paul speaks and says, these things came where unto me, firstly at Antioch, and then the next place is Iconium, the word there for Iconium actually is translated as image, as of in the likeness of. That means that when a man starts to go under a particular teaching, he gets a certain identity. And Lystra, the word for Lystra, I studied it deeply and I realized it means liberty. So, this is the, the process. This is the mind here. The right teaching starts to define a certain identity. And that identity releases you to a particular freedom. Are you with me? The right teaching directs you to a particular image or identity in God. And that identity starts to open up a particular freedom or liberty. Listra, liberty. Are you with me? Are you with me? So, these nine things start to work in the life of a Christian because they are taught what defines their identity and sets them at liberty. If a man is not in this distinction X, anything called doctrine is not doctrine. Anything called man of life is not man of life. Anything called faith is not faith. Anything called persecution is not persecution. It is punishment for wrongdoing. Do you understand what I'm saying? Are we together? Now I understand why James defines the law of liberty. This is to men which are taught and have understood their identity. This is not to some people who don't understand even who they are in God. Praise the Lord. He says, but whosoever looketh into the perfect, the Bible says, law of Liberty, and that's what? Continuous therein. Amplify it for me. I feel I need the amplification of that. It says, uh-huh. But he who looks what? Carefully into the faultless law. That is the law of liberty. And is faithful to it. I love that the amplified calls it faith. Faultless law. Why is it faultless? It is because 
The moment a man has been taught and they've attained a certain identity in God, by the time the Lord releases them into liberty, he has dealt with error. He has dealt with error. Somebody say amen. Amen. You know, some people don't understand. I wish some of you get to the fullest extent of understanding what it means to be justified. Justified means you're right. There are things many Christians cannot handle if we go deep into the message of Christ. Not because they are not existent, but because many people are still partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Many of them are in the knowledge of good and evil. So, there's a probability of them having fault, even in what they define as liberty. The first Adam, if I can take you back, the first Adam, that living soul, he had two choices. As to eat of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He had a choice. And what did he choose? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. The consequence of that is, in every dispensation, to every degree he has liberty, he will be exposed to evil and good. He can do evil in the liberty and he can do good. In what he defines as liberty. When the Christ comes and the tree of life is partaken. He says for all things in Christ are yah and amen. Because he doesn't expect that the justification in the spirit of a man. And that brings him complete because he's taught in the very image that he must carry before God. And released into that liberty can err. See the man of all. The Bible says when the spirit of all comes upon you shall turn into another man. And he says thou shalt prophesy. This is an old testament man. And he says, and whatsoever. He read it. He says, and let it be that when these signs come upon thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee. For God is with you. There was a time when a man could have the spirit of God upon him. And God tells him, do what you want. Yet he had the spirit upon him. But you're telling men in whom the spirit is. To serve their occasion. I say, ah, but it's my occasion in line with the will of God. Why do you even think? That it's not. So, you ask the man the question, what's really the problem? The problem is this. You're not a believer. Or, you're still in the process of believing. That's why the place of justification before God is peace. The place of justification before God is peace. I have peace. You understand? The place of justification before God is It's through this faith that we have access. Being justified freely. You understand? We have shalom. God does not, let me tell you. Do you know why many of you error? It's because you expect and have provided for error in your spirit. For as he thinketh, so he is. But when you tune your spirit to refuse, you realize that the word of God will start working in you. To do the right things. Because that's the essence of righteousness. Righteousness means it's the rightness of God operating in your spirit. When you say, be healed, you're right. God cannot give liberty for a man to execute if he has not been taught the true identity. Of the new creature. That is why many of you, your words seem vain. They're empty. You speak words, but they don't have results. Why? (laughs) Because you have not followed the pattern. You have not followed the pattern. Hallelujah. Are you learning something? So, God expects that, once you're being taught, God expects that the end line is to present a certain man. And once that image, that identity is defined, you're free. Somebody wrote me an email some time back and told me, Apostle Grace, I disagree with you. All sickness cannot be healed. Gave examples of Timothy drinking wine for his stomach, Paul enduring, grace is sufficient. Let me tell you, there are truths in the scriptures that are above others. 
They are all truths. But they are above others. Like Christ is above Moses. But they are all true. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Christ is above Moses. But they are all what? True. And you can't debate that. When you read the scriptures and he says, Whatsoever you ask when you pray. Unless you don't know grammar. Whatsoever. Whatsoever you ask when you pray. Believe that you have received it and you shall have. Listen, he said, whatsoever. Whatsoever takes away whether it's God's will or it's not God's will. His will primarily is whatsoever. Now, you can choose that line of the grace sufficient for you to suffer and die. I'll choose this one. I'll choose that. Listen, Jesus would have said, however... In the whatsoever, you must give a provision. Sometimes I'm not in the mood of doing certain things. No, 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 no. He says, for all things in Christ are yeah and amen. All, yes, all. What if I want yes, all? But you see, even the mere imagination that you can tolerate evil in that liberty, it only means you're not in that liberty yet. It only means you're not in that liberty yet. You can't be in that liberty and regard iniquity. You can't. You can't. Because that identity in Christ does not, cannot. That's the spirit man. That is why every time we're preaching to you, we seek to impart into that man. You understand? Strengthening your inner man by the Holy Spirit. So that we grow that guy. That if there are perfections in your flesh, they will be dealt Weed by that guy. For who saw the sun sets free is free indeed. Somebody say amen. amen. So now I have seen that. And, and I'm, can I show you why you can't err when you're in that place of liberty? Let's go back to the scripture in James. He says, Whosoever looketh, okay? He began from looking. He who looks carefully. Into the faultless law, the law of liberty, and is faithful to it, and perseveres in looking into it. Now listen to the next part. Being not a heedless listener, who forgets, but an active doer, who obeys, he shall be blessed in his doing. His life of obedience. Now let me explain that. It began from seeing, and in the middle he became a listener. In other words, when God takes you to the place of liberty, you listen. You hear. You start to hear. When you step in the place of liberty, the voice is always available to keep you in the right line. You can only refuse it. You can only what? Refuse it. But God has provided everything for you there not to error. You can just say, I don't want your help. That's the only way you can say, okay, now I've walked in error. But by the time you get there, if the teaching was right, there is no way you can refuse to obey. It's not possible. That's why when James is giving that picture, he gives an assumption that he's talking to men who might go there. Or will go there consequently. Are you with me? Who might go there or could go there consequently? We don't know how, but God will lead them there. You understand? You cannot get there unless you are the one who has said, I have refused your help. You see? But then again, how do you refuse it when you're incorruptible? You're born of the incorruptible seed. It, it, it becomes hard. Do you understand? So, James saying that does not mean that every man should take it the evil way to assume that, you know, some people pick the wrong lines in the gospel. 
They can read that and say, they enter there saying, God, I don't want to err. I don't want to err. You see, me, I go there with a purity. You've put too much in me to err. You understand? That's why I cannot err. Because you see, let me tell you, the beginning of you understanding where error begins from is you understanding the ministration of faith. For that which is not done in faith is what? Sin. I don't believe you'll err in your liberty. I don't believe it. That's why when Paul is saying, don't use your liberty for vice, there is an assumption that he knows that certain men have not yet matured to this knowledge. So he also provides for them. But I refuse to think you are among them. Okay, I am believing you are not. Say amen. I am believing that you are not. You are not. So he says, do not use your liberty for vice. You understand? But as a what? As it is an opportunity for you to serve. He, there is an assumption that certain men try to access certain places without that full maturity in it. That is why I say, if you have fully been taught and you have understood the identity in Christ, you cannot err in liberty. You cannot. Like it is possible to go to heaven without dying. It's also possible to first die and go to heaven. Those two are possible. You understand? But you can choose. (laughs) That's the essence of faith. You cannot labor in this liberty if your identity is after the true teaching of God. Because the power to sustain you there is because of the right teaching. That's why the problem, Pastor Nixon, is the teaching. If we teach the right way, men will not err. But if there is an assumption that some people are taught the wrong way, but are transitioning into that liberty, okay, we have also provided for you. Don't use your liberty for vice. If you are among them, don't use your liberty for what? For vice. Don't be, be, be a careful looker, and uh, don't be a forgetful here. For some of you who it works for. But for me, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to believe that I will not err in liberty. Somebody say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Now, then it takes me to the point. When the psalmist in 119 says, I think 94, he says that I've seen the end of all perfection. The end of all perfection. But thy commandment is exceeding broad. I want you to understand this experience. This experience is God got a man and took him to everything perfect and showed it to him. Do you understand? Every man has their own definition of what is perfect. Somebody can pack and now somebody says, perfect. You can put on a cloth and say, ah, perfect. You can put on a cheap hair thing and say, ah, yeah, 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 perfect. You understand what I'm saying? Somebody comes to you and they tell you, am I smart? And then you look at them and you're like, eh. Perfect. <laughs> this is not perfect according to the ident- ideas of men. It's not according to the opinion of men. This is God saying, to me this is perfect. Amen. He shows it to him. The man understands it. He takes him to another place and tells him, this is also perfection. According to me. Are you hearing me? He literally got a man, put him in his spirit, and said to show him what is perfect according to God. And when he led that man under everything of perfection, to the end, he told him, look at the word. He tells him, but... You, but your word is exceedingly broad. Now the word there also is, your word is exceedingly at liberty and free. It has no limitations, no boundaries. Do you understand? The beginning of the word of God in your life, when you say, I'm studying the word, you're supposed to study the word from the end of all perfection. 
If you have not gotten there, before you study this word, first go to the end of all perfection. And that now shows the two kinds of teaching in the word of God. The primary teaching of the gospel is to lead men to all perfection. Then they start the word. (laughs) Everything we call it the word. Because in its all entirety, it is the word of God. But there is a word that leads a man to the end of all perfection. And there is the word that takes over the man when all perfection is ended. Otherwise, it's the difference between... You remember in in, uh, 119 verses 18? Psalm 119 verse 18? Let's go there. Same chapter. He says, open my eyes. He says, that I may behold wondrous things of thy word, of thy law. There is a man who is telling God, open my eyes to behold the wondrous things of your word. There is a difference between beholding the wondrous things of the word of God and beholding the word in its entirety without those things. Because they still know after all these things. See, the word of God can show you everything. And after that, it will still be deeper than everything you've seen. I don't know that I'm speaking to you. God can take you to the highest things in the spirit. And after that, still tell you all those things are nothing. I'm still deeper. Do you know a man can get get very excited about the things he has seen in the word and then lose the essence of the word? You can have very many visitations and say, I saw the glassy sea. But even if you didn't see the glassy sea, if you came back and say, I only saw the glassy sea, to God it's not important that you only saw the glassy sea. What next? The prophet in the Old Testament, he also had the same experience. He went to heaven, saw the glassy seas, saw the angels, everyone was worshipping God. And there is something pushing him, telling him you don't end there. There is more. The sea is beautiful, but there is more. There are 17 doors of this, but there is more. There are seven eyes, which are the spirit of God. Yes, but there is more. The, 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 there's, there's a scripture in Zechariah that speaks of the angel of the Lord. This guy, which leads to the mysteries in God. You understand? He's amazing. And every door opens you to another world. Because it, it, it either takes you closer to a new dimension, or introduces you to another one. Do you understand? But after all that, God still tells you there is more. Until this guy bumps into a meeting. Jehovah God was there. Jesus Christ. Maybe a few angels. And he, 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 he reached when they were already talking. He didn't even know what was in there. He, he reached when they were saying, Who shall we send? Because he sent me. <laughs> the Bible didn't say that he knew what they were talking about. No. The Bible is very clear. The scriptures are very clear. As he was moving in all this. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? He didn't even know why they were sending, what they were sending for, for which reason they were sending it. He just said, Ah, if, if there is a point where God is sending me, I'm available. Yeah. And guess what? The man was anointed and he came back on earth with a call. With a call. Somebody don't come back with a, to the earth with something. They come back with just an experience of glassy seas. And then I saw 17 angels, and then they were all shining. Yes, but there is more to God. Are you hearing me? And then I saw this, and then I saw that. Yes, all of that is perfect, but there is more. Get which is more. That is why when the man of Ecclesiastes is speaking about the labors of the men under the sun, he calls it vanity. But the end of this perfection, he also calls it vexation of spirit. You see, it's one thing to get to the end of what you call perfect. You understand? And then after seeing what is perfect, it starts to bore you. There was a time, Ericsson, when they had just come, there was a time, they were the perfect phones. The days when they used to put them here like this. And everyone used to walk like this. Then you say, my daddy has a mobile phone. During that time, it was perfect. But now, it's a shame to put a phone here. I'm sorry if you have one. (laughs) I'm just saying, for me. (laughs) 
In our senior fall vacation, we put on nice suits and they took photos of us. Then I looked at that photo and I said, How come I didn't see these suits were oversized? <laughs> because in our eyes, those years, they were fitting. Who understands what I'm saying? Look at your parents' old photos of marriage. They have oversized suits. You say, but why was it oversized? To them during that time, they would say... (laughs) Now we are the place where those things vex. If they gave it to you now, that old suit, you'd get vexed. Are you hearing me? Somebody say amen. But I want you to get deeper into what I'm trying to say here. That everything in God is perfect. But there comes a point where it all passes. And then again, what's most important is God. That is why the Amplified calls them the bottomless things. If you want to go in the things of the Spirit, listen, they are bottomless, they are endless. God will surprise you every day. Even when we get to heaven, we shall be surprised every day. Some non-believer said, Ah, me, I can't go to heaven. You're just singing the whole day, blowing trumpets, and you... I told him... I told him... I can speak a tongue in five minutes. And you're no more. I said, why? Because, you see, I'm trying to make you understand that God is way deeper than your small human imagination about him. Let me tell you, God does not cease to amaze. Look at the Bible. It is just a few pages, but it has been preached every day and it is still deeper. Look at the Bible. Every day you see something new in the word of God. The prayer of the man that God will open his eyes to see. Because there is always something to see. I told him, boss, in heaven will be, uh, listen, this is eternal life. That you might know the one true God. And it's only son Jesus. There is always more in God. Tell your neighbor, there is always more in God. Tell him again. There is always more in God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to bring this to a close, but there is something I need to push out, in, out of my spirit before I bring it out. So, I saw that there are certain people who are still excited in the things of the word. Do you understand? But many of them had not gotten to the end of these things. Perfection of all things. That is why, that's the beginning of what God calls them land spirit. Somebody say, oh, but I, what is the land spirit? That's exactly what it is. The land spirit is a man who has gone to the end of all perfection. When God starts to speak to that man, the Bible says, He wakeneth my ear to hear as that which is what? As the land. As the land. Your ear opens and then you start to hear like a land person. You start to hear like a land person. Why? Because... Our pre- the fullness of all this has to reveal everything perfect in God. That is why when there's a place where you reach in God and nothing in this world, nothing in this world is of importance. What is killing us as Christians is because we still have a certain attachment to the perfections of this world. Yet in God there is deeper Let me tell you, that is not the foundation that built the gospel. The foundation that built the gospel was being spent and spending all for the sake of Christ. And counting all things but loss for the excellence of Christ. They cannot be lost unless you have seen their end. Because in its own, everything has an end. I was reading the memoirs of East African Revival. Many of you have had the experiences of Joe Edward Church and his wife Desi. Uh, before that, the 1893 guy, George Pilkington, the guy who translates the local, uh, the, 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 the Bible to, 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 to Luganda. And there were guys like Erika Sabiti, 
and then there was a group of guys uh, Sibambi, Simeon Sibambi and uh, he was married to a lady I, I, I don't remember, Ava and um, his brother was called Blasio Chizito and then there was another guy William Nagenda and by the way all those guys married one family there was something about that family I'm, I'm still researching why did all the revivalists marry from one family to be continued? But one time Simeon Sibambi gets a radical thing. One time he was on the Rezori Mountain spraying. I read. And then God told him, take off your shoes for where you're standing is holy ground. This guy had gone to school. He removed his shoes and started praying. <laughs> then he told his sons and daughters, from that day God told him, never put on your shoes. Sibambi never put on shoes until he died. Yet he was the minister of health in Uganda. Clean fellow, but he doesn't put on his shoes. Now, of course I know, looking at a man walking bare feet, eh, you'd be thinking, hey, man, why is this guy walking bare feet? He's not deep. You understand? It's all understandable. But you see, I saw this from the eyes of God. And I said, what if this man was claiming Uganda to be holy? <laughs> What if he was saying this is too holy for me to put if oh, oh, oh what if he was claiming our nation to be holy and so this man of God removes his shoes because he's claiming our nation by faith that a holy people will rise out of that nation that Uganda will be the epitome of holiness across the world oh God bring those days quicker bless that man and his children but he looked stupid Are you hearing me? And let me tell you, once you get to the end of many things that seem perfect in the eyes of men, some people start to do radical things, not because they are mad men, no, but because they look for a city whose founder and builder is God. Hallelujah. Is who? Is God. One time, many years ago, I was at campus, about second year. God took me for a certain walk. Certain walk. You know where just, God just comes and picks you up and says, let's walk together. I want to show you something. So we walked and walked. I could feel that it was an experience. Now, this, what, you, what I was calling walking were experiences upon experiences. Where you're coming out of one thing and you're entering another. You're coming out of one thing and you're entering another. You're coming out of one thing and you're entering another. You're coming out of one thing and you're entering another. You're coming out of one thing and you're entering into another. And then I get to the place of the end of something and I, could, I, I knew that these were all perfections. I could sense in my spirit that these were all kinds of perfections. Then he took me to a place and told me this is where men really die. You know? Death, eh? when we say, when Paul says I'm dead to the world and the world is dead to me. When Paul says I'm dead, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who freely gave himself for me. Saints, there is a place where we die. True death is actually death to the world and its experiences in their highest degree of perfection and every satisfaction that comes with it. Every satisfaction that comes with it. There's a man who may not sleep right now because he got a car. You understand? But there's a man who gets the most expensive car and still sleep. Not because it's not nice, but because he has died to the satisfaction of however expensive that car is. It only starts to open up in that man's spirit to know that I was called for another world. And my satisfaction comes from another world. There are certain things, the moment they start to connect in the spirit, they are my satisfaction. You understand? When Paul looks at the church and looks at the saints as his reward, you understand? Some people think rewards are, oh, I've built many houses because I've walked with God. I have nice cars. I've walked with God. Oh, look at everything I have. You understand? But you see, Paul looks at the church and says, for you are my true reward. You can't force it to be. You're either to the end of this thing or not. And brethren, many saints are still alive here. 
We are still alive here. That is why we kill each other, compete with each other, hate each other, envy, strife, contention. All of these things, oh, all of these things are this. Even that man won't pray because he feels a bit tired. He has not really died. Let me tell you, true death is God killing you from anything that is perfect in this world with its satisfaction. That everything can come to you and for sure will come to you. But it's like people quote the scripture, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and the rest of the things shall be added unto you. There's a man who thinks of those things only of the world. Seek God, you'll get a house. It will be added. Seek God, you'll get a car. It will be added. But when you get to this line here, the rest of the things become priceless. Because it's not in money and cars. You cannot force yourself to want to save souls. You can't force yourself to want to preach. Are you hearing me? You cannot. That is why when I find men on the streets, I give them money. Do you know why? Because by the time somebody loses their stature and position, yes, they also have wives and husbands. They also want to look beautiful like you. But something starts to boil up in their soul. And they find themselves on Kampala Road. They are abused, they are scorned, they are scorned, but they are still saying, Jesus is Lord. Brethren, they got to the end of things. Some of us are even afraid to be called Christians. We compromise where men want to, to call us to. We are all, there are certain people who, but the way they pray is uncool. The way they worship is ungodly. The way they pray, it's because you're still alive to what you think is perfect in worship. But there's a place God can take you. And you don't know whether you want to fall prostrate or stand up. And everything is okay. Because there is a man who did it. His clothes fell off and he forgot he was naked. There was a glory upon him. There was an indifferent one in the, in the window. The Bible says she was looking behind him. And she scorned at him. And the Bible says that day, that woman became barren. Michal never had children. She raised children that were not her own. Why? Now, of course if David was dancing, people would say, David, we know you're deep. But this has been pushed to the farthest end. And let me tell you, saints, you can never understand a man's worship until you know his dealings. This guy killed a lion and a bear without an atomic bomb. They could steal animals and he runs after them. And the Bible says, and he smites them. Are you hearing me? When he's standing before Goliath, he has a covenant that even if he swings the stone the wrong way, it will go the right direction. Some of us have seen God too much. But when, when we sit down and say, let me pray from here, leave me alone. Because you don't understand. You, you understand? When, when you see us dancing, we are not excited youth. No, you don't understand. Some of us, oh, some, listen, all of this was perfect until it stopped being perfect. And I could drive the car and still feel vexed in the spirit. I could leave a nice way and still feel vexed in the spirit. I could put on a nice cloth and still feel vexed in the spirit. I could look in my mirror and I see a good haircut and I still feel vexed in the spirit. And every time I go to God, I tell him there must be more. One way to study correct one. One way to tackle a bulunja. I don't know what it is, but there are things I feel. They're not enough. And then I preach. And then I go back home and I feel like I've done it. I, I feel like I've done it. But we're still telling Christians, please preach the gospel. Reach out to our fellow brethren. Let me tell you, revival has not hit Uganda. It's not revival. When we are still telling men to preach. No. It's revival when men preach by accident. They don't even know they are preaching. It is revival when a man goes to sleep. Composed. And he wakes up at 2 a.m. And he hears his lips blabbing. Bakaya, baba, baba, kaya. You don't even know why it's there. But there is something. The Bible says that they were looking for a country. And a city whose founder was God. We had to believe that it was possible. To have a foundation full of God.
We had to believe that it was possible to walk full of God, to think full of God, to act full of God, to lose everything full of God. Why? Because we had to get to... And that's why I, mean, I already stole God. Since second year, I told him, God, kill me. While some were asking for cars, we were telling God, kill me. Me. While some are looking for the next house, me, I'm telling God, kill me. Listen, there's something about dying to the world. Let me tell you why. Because the Bible says, to be absent from the flesh is to be present with the Lord. The moment you start to die to the world, you start to become present. He, every time he's looking for somebody to deal with, you're there. Many Christians are attending Fanero, but they are not available. People go for conferences, but they are not available. Why? Because the place of death is what makes you present. For us, we call that scripture only for dead men. I said, God, oh, that I may abide. Because he says, if you abide, may no, stay present to me. You can't stay present until you really die to the world. Brethren, the life of the spirit is not supposed to be occasional visitations. No. The life of the spirit is supposed to be an ever constant presence before God. That in everything you do, he's there. You feel him. You can touch him. You can talk to him. You don't have to create a nice bedroom to talk to him. No. You can talk to him any day because you're too dead not to be available. And he's too alive to you not to talk. Oh, God hates the day. When men will understand what I'm saying. We can never see God, man of God, until we really die. And I've realized that for me, my dealing as a man of God is to make sure that nothing in these perfections limits me to really know the word. Because God starting to teach you has to get to the end of perfection. If you're still in the perfections, you've not learned anything yet. You've not learned anything yet. God... You see, there are things God can say and they will blow your mind. You understand? There are even things that can make you run mad if they are said in a time when you're still engaged in the perfections of this world. Because it would look outwardly indifferent. You might even doubt that it is God speaking. But when, for example, Paul tells you, I have revealed, I am accountable of no man's blood. Listen to this statement. For I have revealed the whole counsel of God. Imagine. Paul knew the whole counsel of God. According to what was given to him as a master builder to lay the foundation. Do you understand? And he understood the responsibility of the fact that if he doesn't reveal the whole fullness of this, the lives of men are going to be destroyed. So he's living a life where every day he wants to save as many bloods and be pure of them because he knows that even if he left 1% of the 99 he has preached of the council, a 1% could be destroyed because he hasn't done it. The The desperacy and hunger and thirst in that man's spirit is different for a man who doesn't even know that there is such a thing as the counsel of God in its fullness. Or that everything you do is equal to the blood of men. You can't make a man feel it. You can't make a man feel it. No. A man can only experience it when he has gotten to the end of all that makes perfect. Because that's the beginning of God starting to show you. You see, that's why the Bible says there are things that are unsearchable. There are things in God, even if you pray, you can never search them out. Even if you read a book, you can never search them out. Even if you fast for the purpose of searching them out, you can't. They are found by them who feel after. They are found by them who feel after. When a man starts to feel after God, there are certain things he will start to expose to you. Why? Because those are important. That is why when Paul says, I'm in tears for you, my brethren, he's not praying for them. He's not in tears because they're sleeping hungry. No, 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 no. He's not a threat who only affects your flesh. He, he, his, his pain is 
He prays that men will get to that end and understand what's really important in the gospel. I used to say, but why don't certain people feel a certain way? Listen, you, even, if you tell, even if you preach a thousand messages, if it's not in a man, it's not in a man. Evan Roberts or stole God. Kill me. Benny, kill me, bend me. Smith who goes worse. Kill me, bend me. And all of these men were used of God. They were, it was the same thing that was in their heads. I want to get to the end of all perfection. Where nothing in the world seems to be my attention except you. Except you. I read the story of this woman in the north called Irene Glesson. She came in the northern Uganda. Saw how the impoverished the people were. She went back home, sold everything and came to start an orphanage in the north of Uganda. And I read that she met Christians and told them her vision and some she gave money and they robbed her. Somebody is selling off everything they have to come and live a full life in God to reach out to our people. And there is somebody in the middle here who looks like the people they are going to help. And he's robbing of that. The Bible calls it the last of this world. The last of the things of this world. Because the Bible says the last is for the things of this world. And how, how amazing that we go to prayer. And the Bible says we ask and receive not because we pray amiss. For we want to consume it on our own last. Meaning, many percentages of our prayer, even when we go to God, He can check inside us and find that in us there is lust. I am praying for something that is of the world. But it is presented in a holy manner. It is presented in words that appear to be holy. That is why the Bible tells every Christian to examine themselves. Don't, don't, whether you be in the faith. There's a point where you have to go to God and tell God, now, I'm not judging who, I don't even want anyone to judge me. Me, me now, let me examine myself. Am I really in this thing because I'm in it? Or I'm in it because there's something else? Do you know how much influence, I always tell you, do you know how much influence we have in this room to change this nation? How much influence we have in this room? But there's someone who came because they want a job. There's another one who came because they want a wife. There's another one who wants a husband. There's another one who wants a house. There's another one who wants... Everyone wants something except... See, that's why there has to come a time where men should lift up their hands and say, God, what do you want to do with me? People can go to service just to know what God wants. But many times, me, I counsel people. 98% of the people who I counsel they come with needs of this world. Oh, apostle, my wife. Oh, apostle, my car. Oh, apostle, my job. Oh, text messages come every night. That's why some of them I don't answer. Because, <laughs> listen, when shall we ever get to a point where a man will really want to pray? And they are genuine, not because you preached it, but they are genuinely wanting God. When will you ever get to a point where we can count all things? But that is why we are not even receiving these things. Why? Because we are looking at them instead of looking at Christ, which is the oath and the finish of our faith. Now, liberty is about to come. And to some it is come. But that liberty requires that men have the right spirit before God. Ladies and gentlemen. God is dealing with us in ways you can never imagine. The days of going to church because you want a job, they are going to come to an end. The days of going to church because you have a stomachache, that means if you did not have a stomachache, you would not be in Fanero today. Bakugambia, there is a guy who prays for sick people, and then you came. I pray to God that your eyes will open way deeper. Because even healing is a perfection. The word of God goes beyond healing. Are you hearing me? That we'll get to the point where, yes, he opens our eyes to see the wonderful things in the world. But even deeper than that, he also launches us deeper past those things to see more in him. Let me tell you, there's a place, I told people, there's a place in the Bible where the Bible says the elements melt. 
The kingdom of God has elements, I told you. But even there's a place where all these elements melt. And sometimes oh, oh, all that you re- re- remain with in this world is that you walked circumspect to truth and your purpose on us. Look at the man's order of things. Doctrine, not cars. Manner of life, not cars. Purpose, not houses. Are you seeing where I'm coming from? Faith, not husband. Are, are you seeing what I'm saying? Persecution, love, patience. There is nothing of this world. Nothing. Somebody one time told me, some people are too heavenly minded to be of earthly good. There is no such thing, child of God. You cannot be too heavenly minded and then you don't do good on earth. That is just an inexcusable explanation of men which do not understand what it means to really have a heavenly mind. The church, I, for me all my life, I've not seen men who are too heavenly minded to be of earthly good. I've seen men who are too earthly minded to be of heavenly good. But we, we are also thinking that those men exist. It's very easy to borrow a line because you had a mother man say it. But those days also have to come to an end and men should have to a place of reckoning. Say what is revealed to you. Don't just say because you're saying. And in that instance, he's, he's abusing a man who is praying longer. Do you know what prayer does? Do you know that prayer is an instruction to pray always in the Holy Ghost? Always in the Holy Ghost. Prayer is not, that's why I'm not interested in just a bunch of intercessors for Fandero. No, everybody must be an intercessor. Because intercession is a vocation for every believer. It's not for a few special people who can pray longer, who have a deep voice. No. Are you hearing me? I remember when we were in university, we used to go to the mountain to pray every night. And I used to have a problem and say, hey God, why don't some of these people make people feel the way we feel you know and and i realized one thing and i realized the difference between us and those men was there was a point we considered to die let me tell you sense let's die let's die let's die when we really die we will see god we'll be present to the lord i'm sorry if i've not addressed your job I'm sorry if I've not addressed your marriage. Pilkington, the guy I was telling you about, when he, he was a part of the Church Missionary Society, he, he, in his story, he says he was among Ugandans and he fought a bunch of Christians, but he was disturbed that many people did not look to appear to carry the conviction of the life they claimed to have. You understand? And that's what takes that man to a certain island somewhere in Sese, a place called Kombe or something. And then he spends countless days fasting for our people and praying. He just simply was praying that men will start to feel after. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the men who are responsible for the gospel in our nation. The reason why I made a statement like that, and one day I'll preach about church history if you want me to, I can give you more details of the things I've learned. But I've realized that salvation did not come cheap. It's expensive, even though it's free. Are you hearing me? People who are going to change tomorrow, they don't just pick flowers and come to fellowships, talk to each other, talk about love, and then tickle each other, and then speak about themselves, and then against them fall, and then they laugh, and then they go back, and then... No, 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 no. Listen, we have to take this seriously. Why? Because there's another move coming in our nation. And you hear me and hear me real good. God is starting to deal with men individually. For us, our dream as Fanero is simple. Some people think, in fact, many people think that we put Fanero about above Christ. No, 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 no. Fanero is a vision for Christ. Let me make you understand that. Fanero is a vision of Christ. Do you understand? Our heart's desire, and the Lord knows, is simple. We don't want to leave this earth with only cars and houses. 
we want to leave this earth with something vibrating. Let me tell you, they will write about us. And they will say, those men and women loved God, saw God, and were dead. We have to start doing things dead men do. We have to start praying like dead men. We have to start believing like dead men. We have to start paying prices that dead men pay. You cannot tell me anymore, oh, I failed to pray because I didn't have transport. Listen, there, let me tell you, let me tell you, some of you. There are kids I know who walk every day to here. They walk every day to here. There's a girl who sent me a text message. They beat her up, locked her up in a room, took away her phone. Hired people on the road to get her and throw her back in the house simply because she's attending a prayer meeting. And she told me, but my sister who drinks alcohol, they let her go out. And I went on my knees and I said, God, thank you that there is somebody in this world being beaten for the gospel. There is somebody with a car who has options of praying and not praying. There is somebody who is free, even has transport and has options. Do you really think we are still preaching to make money or to become famous? Listen, the gospel has already made us famous, even if we didn't preach. No. Our mandate, you must understand, is simple. They cannot still tell us, we can't be reading in the tabloids every day that 80% is Christianity, Uganda. And we are still ranking top of corruption. There is something wrong with what we define, it. We define as Christianity. And definitely it's not wrong with those government officials. It's wrong with the church. Because charity begins at home. There's something wrong. Poverty, disease, all of these things are here in our nation. And we're still thinking that the answer is, the answer is not in government programs. The answer is in Christians. Righteousness exalted the nation. And that righteousness you carry, imputed on you through Christ. So it's the rightness working in our spirits that draws the degree of the prosperity of a nation. You cannot tell me that we are more prosperous than certain nations, yet that we claim that we are righteous, yet they are more prosperous. There's a problem. There's a problem. Even if we appear to be praying, God is just and is true. There's something the Muslims do right than us who have the book. And we better start waking up and be serious. We don't come here because we don't have anything to do. No. We come here because every day we are building onto something. And we have a hope and a future one day that we will look back and say, Man, we is all without. We preach the gospel. And the results have come. You must die. Raise your hand and speak to God. Ooh. I'm desperate for you. Talk to God. I'm lost without you. I want you to talk to God. Just take a minute and talk to God. I'm desperate for you. Tell him God kill me. Kill me. I'm lost without you. Doctrine. Manner of life. Purpose, faith, charity, patience, perseverance, persecutions, in afflictions, in all these things that God will teach you, that He will give you an identity, and that He will make you free to walk at liberty. Come on. Take another minute. Come on. Let's pray for you. I'm lost without you. Let's pray for you. Today, don't ask for anything. Tell him, God, I need to know my purpose.
Where am I alive? Where was I created? Why me, Lord? Come on, take more time. This is for God. You can give Him time.
Take another minute or two. Father Lord, kill us. Kill us. Kill us. Bend us. Break us. Everybody lift your hands in the heavens. This is my honest and heartfelt prayer to God. God help us. God help us. God help us. Help us. In Jesus mighty name. Amen. If you're here. And you've never given your life to Christ? Put up your hand and say, I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you want to be born again and you're here, you're not born again, but you want to be born again. If you're here and you say, I want to be born again today, put up your hand and we'll lead you through. I see a hand there. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? I see another hand behind there. I see another one there. God bless you. Put up your hand and say, I want Jesus today. There's another one up there. God bless you. And somebody says, just say, I want Jesus today. God bless you. Those of you who have put up your hands, repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that you are Lord, that you died and rose again as the one true Son of God. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you have made that prayer, you put up your hands, come and see this gentleman. We are going to take your details and we will follow you through prayer with you and uh, tell you exactly what it means to be born again. If you are sick in your body, God is healing you now. There is somebody with a heart problem. You came with pain. The lower side of your here it's a heart issue God is healing you now in the name of Jesus Christ if somebody you've been having a throat infection I want you to check yourself God is healing you now your throat come God is gonna heal you now God is healing the sick if you're sick just receive your healing now regardless of the sickness regardless of the sickness Raise your hands. I'm desperate for you. Thank you, Lord. I'm lost without you. If you're sick, God is healing you now. Receive your healing. Somebody, you came with a pain in your right hand. Eh? Your right hand. Where are you? Come. Come. You have a pain in your right hand. Come, come. Come, come. God is going to heal you now. Right hand. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Somebody have a pain in your nose, this part. It has been with the heat. Where are you? Is somebody been having a problem with your nose? Your right hand. Give me your hand. Power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody has a problem here. With your nose, where are you? The other one? The other one? Hand, come. Somebody, go. somebody has a problem with your nose. What's your problem? Your hand. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Somebody has a nose issue. Where are you? Okay. 
I command this hand. Be healed. Power of the Holy Ghost. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Thank you, Lord. What's your problem? Throat. It's God. Give the Lord a mighty hand. I will praise somebody. Is it pain? Pain is it there? Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command healing now, 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 now. There is somebody with a problem here. See, something is pricking, pricking. The other one, come. I speak healing right now. Be healed. Be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Your right hand. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Your nose. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Somebody has a pain in your jaw. Your right jaw. Feels like it was twisted. Where are you? Somebody has a pain in your jaw. Your right hand. Heal. Heal. In the name of Jesus. Your nose. Heal. 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 Who has a jaw problem? There's somebody with a jaw problem. Your right jaw. It's right. Is it right? Let him come. Thank you, Lord. Be healed. 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 It's done. Just go. It's your healed. Where is the guy with a joke issue? I need to pray for you now. Is it right, hand? Come. Are you still feeling pain? It's gone. Praise God. Somebody with a joke issue. You're right, Joe. Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's somebody you have an infection. You have an infection. Your knots of your throat was some time ago was swollen. Come. Yes. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Joe, be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Somebody's walking without sticks. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. 
you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Pastor Zach, follow us. You can go home, the rest of you. That on Sunday we need 700 people or eight. Did they announce it. Please be there. Meet the 32. Yeah, it's about an hour's time. Where? Rugby grounds. Praise God. No more sticks for that young man. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm blessed, Lord. Every 
part of her life. No more struggle. No more struggle. Serve the Lord. And there's prayer for you. And those without you.
The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.